you can go ahead and have a seat this morning. As you're getting settled in, open up to the book of Romans, chapter 4. It's where we're going to be at this morning, Romans chapter 4. And today is Mother's Day. Guys, I hope this is not the reminder you needed, because if it is, you got 30 minutes to figure out how to redeem yourself. And... uh, May the odds be in your favor. Um, and ladies, if you're here, we just want to appreciate you and, and say how much we, we thank you for everything you do for your families, for, for our church family as well. And so as you leave today, our First Impressions team has a gift for you. We've got a Mother's Day devotional for you. So stop by the Connection Center out front. They've got those available to you. But uh, on that note, we're going to be talking a lot about family here this morning and and, and, and unpacking that idea of family quite a bit. And, and with that, by show of hands, how many of you are in or have a family? See, it's kind of comical because this is all of us. If you didn't raise your hand, I know who to single out for the next few minutes. You can ignore me, but I won't ignore you. Um, but, but see, we all have family, and, and some of our families are really intricate and complex and varied. We, we can see our family history and lineage, and we can kind of track that and go through and, and understand, wow, this is, this is what's going on. And some of our families are very simple and kind of orderly and, and very basic in, in our family lineage. And, and see, there's been a huge influx of people wanting to know more about their family of origin, more about their ancestry, more about where did I come from, who are my ancestors, who are the people that got me here today. And, and Ancestry.com has been popular for many years, probably the last 10 years or so, because they've used public records and information to help people put those pieces together. Well, in the last couple of years, Ancestry DNA and services like 23andMe have, have ramped that up by having DNA-based ancestry study. So, so you can send in a DNA sample and they'll help match you with your family and help say, okay, this is more information about your family. This is your origin. These are what nationalities, what background you have. And in 2017 alone, that industry saw a 300% growth. Last year alone, 12 and a half million people said, hey, here's some of my spit. What can you tell me about my family? (laughs) And when you see numbers like that, it kind of makes you go, hmm, why are that many people interested? And I think it's because at some level, we all have a desire to know more about our family of origin, more about how do we get here? Where do we come from? Who are we? Who are my ancestors? What do they do? Because at some level, knowing about our past can help inform us about our, our today and our future as well. And so as we look at the book of Romans today, Paul's going to do a little bit of that. He's going to do a little bit of ancestry study on our family of faith. Because see, Scripture says that when we believe in Jesus, we are, are called sons and daughters of God. Another area of Scripture says we are adopted into God's family. And so we've got our immediate you know, household family, but then Scripture says that when we believe in God and follow him, we have a, a, a spiritual family as well. We're, we're basically brothers and sisters with those that we're sitting next to in this moment here. And so Paul's going to take us back and say, okay, how'd this all start? How did we get to this place where we have a spiritual family? And to do that, he's going to use and go back to the story of a guy named Abraham from the book of Genesis. And Abraham, it says, is the founder of all this. God selected Abraham and said, okay, you are going to be the founder of this. You're going to be the father of this family. And and he makes a covenant with Abraham in Genesis chapter 15 and says, you are going to start my nation, the the nation of my chosen people. But if you're familiar with this story, you know that Abraham and his wife Sarah didn't have children. So when he says, you're going to start the nation, they probably had to go, well, it's going to be a small nation. Sorry. (laughs) You know, they didn't have children. They were unable to have children. But we know from the story that God miraculously provides them with a son Isaac later on in the story. And so we're going to unpack, kind of go behind the scenes, what happened here, and not just so we can understand Abraham better, but so we can understand how we should function as people who are desiring to follow Jesus, but also how our family should reflect God's model for family as well. So Romans chapter 4, that's where we're going to be at this morning. So let's take a look at that together, starting down in verse 13. It says this, For the promise to Abraham and his offspring— that he would be the heir to the world, did not come through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. For if it is the adherents of the law who are to be heirs, then faith is null and the promise is void. For the faith brings wrath, for the law brings wrath. It would help if I could actually read here. But where there is no law, there is no transgression. Verse 16, that is why it depends on faith 
in order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his offspring, not only to the adherents of the law, but also to the one who shares the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us at all. As it is written, I have made you the father of many nations in the presence of God in whom he believed, who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. It says, in hope he believed against hope that he should become the father of many nations. As he had been told, so shall your offspring be. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was as good as dead, since he was about a hundred years old, or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb. No unbelief made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God, fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. That is why his faith was counted to him as righteousness. But the words, it was counted to him, were not written for his sake alone, but ours also. It will be counted to us who believe in him who raised from the dead Jesus our Lord, who is delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. Now there's a lot going on here. There's a lot that Paul's wanting to teach us. So let's, let's take this kind of bit by bit. Because he's taking us back to the beginning and he's wanting us to understand that our family of origin begins with faith. Because Abraham is used as the example by Paul here for, for one particular reason. And it's not because Abraham was better than all of us. It's not because he, he had, you know, the right social standing or the right job or the right position. Abraham is highlighted by, by Paul in this passage because of his faith. He says that the reason God was able to work in his life, the reason God brought this promise into Abraham's life was because of his faith. And, and we're, we're referencing this promise a lot. And, and Paul says it several times, the promise given to Abraham, the promise of Abraham. So let's think about that for a sec, because it's actually three promises wrapped into one. First, Abraham is promised descendants. We've already touched on this a little bit. They didn't have children. I'm sure the, the thing they wanted more than anything in the world was to have children. And, and God comes and says, your descendants will be as numerous as the stars. And they're going to they're gonna create a nation. And so God is promising not just that he's going to have children, but that through his family line, he, it's going to be a, a numerous and plentiful family line. And, and this alone is a huge promise, a huge you know, blessing that God's saying, hey, I'm going to bring this into your life. But then he's also promised land. And not like the, hey, I'm going to give you 40 acres with a nice babbling brook and a porch that overlooks the sunsets so you can kind of, you know, retire out there. No, he's saying that, that hey, your children, your grandchildren, your great-grandchildren, they're going to have land because your people are going to go and you're going to start a new nation. Imagine being told today, your kids, your grandkids are going to go and start a new nation. You're going to leave this place, start a new nation, but not only that, that this nation would be God's chosen people. The, the people with whom God has favor. So we got two promises. The third adds to it. God says, you will be blessed. And it seems a little redundant because you're like, okay, the first two are already a blessing. But no, he says in Genesis 12 too, he says, you will be blessed so that you can be a blessing. Basically he's saying, I'm going to use you, Abraham, to be my conduit, my delivery system of blessings to the world. I'm going to bless you so much that it's going to overflow into the lives of the people around you, into the world around you. That is how I'm going to deliver my blessings is what he's saying. And so Abraham's getting the, these huge promises, and if it's us, we might be tempted to be cynical and think, oh, you know, we'll get one out of three maybe. Maybe we'll get half of one of those. But listen again to what Paul says about Abraham. Abraham's attitude in this. He says, No unbelief made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God, fully convinced that God was able to do as he had promised. If you got your own Bible this morning, it's verses 20 and 21. You're going to want to circle, highlight, underline those. That is the core of, of who Abraham was and what God's desire for us is as well. But see, his faith also had a result to it. His faith had a result in that Paul says it was counted to him as righteousness. If you've been here the last few weeks, we've been going through Romans, and this word righteousness is a super important word for Paul. Because this word righteousness isn't something that he would ever use lightly, ever something that he would apply to someone without great consideration of whether or not it was, it was a good fit for them. Because righteousness is the perfect uh, holy living, perfectly upholding God's law and instruction, righteous living that God expects from all of us. 
And Paul starts in, in Romans chapter 1 talking about that's what God desires from us, for us to follow his instructions and commandments to the letter. But then immediately afterwards, Paul says, we can't do that because of sin. He says, we have, we have chosen to worship and follow ourselves and our own desires and longings rather than God's. And, and we are broken and corrupted and tainted by sin. And so we cannot be righteous. And so when, when Paul here is saying that Abraham had righteousness, it's not that he's perfect like Jesus. He had plenty of mistakes we see in the Old Testament. But it's that he trusted in God. In the same way that when we have faith in Jesus, there's something that takes place there. Because Jesus was the, the one and only Son of God and Savior of the world who came and lived a perfect and sinless life. He was falsely condemned and crucified and rose three days later. And his life is perfectly righteous. And Scripture says that when we believe in Jesus and follow him with our life, his righteousness is, is placed into our life. So the, the language of Paul here, it's counted to us. It's placed on our account. It's placed on our record. And, and what that means for us is that when we follow Jesus, when God looks at our life, he doesn't see mistakes. He doesn't see sin and, and failures and shortcomings. Instead, if we follow Jesus, he sees Jesus' perfect life placed on top of ours. And that's the good news, and that's, that's what the Scripture de defines as justification, that we are made right with God through faith and obedience to Jesus. And, and this is what Paul's describing Abraham did. His faith in God covered up his failures, his mistakes, his shortcomings because of his extreme faith. And it, it applies to us. Verse 23, if you look towards the end, it says, but the words, it was counted to him, that is Abraham, were not written for his sake alone, but ours also. It will be counted to us who believe in him who raised from the dead Jesus our Lord, who is delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. So when we fully trust in and believe in Jesus, his perfect life is overlaid on top of ours. That is the good news of the gospel. That is the good news of Jesus for us. No matter what our past looks like, no matter what failures, mistakes, shortcomings we have, Jesus makes it possible for us to be made right with God. And all that happens through faith through trusting and following in Jesus. And for Abraham here, the interesting thing is his faith didn't happen in a vacuum. It didn't happen in a classroom setting. It didn't happen in a neat and tidy way. But it happened through his family situation. And for him, the, the intersection of his life and faith happened at the point of family. And so, so this is why we're going to be talking about family a lot this morning. And, and, and this is where I'm going next with this, because I think that I think that for us, how we interact with our family, how we interact with our kids, our, our extended family, even our friends and neighbors, has a lot to say about what we believe about Jesus and where we're at with him. And so I want to take a few minutes to talk about faith-based parenting. Because Abraham is going to be a model for us in, in several of these things. And some of you might look at, at me and go, okay, you're the Young Beck student pastor. Um, do you even have children? What do you know about faith-based parenting? Um, I'm still figuring that out with my wife. We've got a two and a half year old. We've got one more on the way. So we're, we're in process. We're learning as well. But we're going to be leaning on scripture and what it shows us here through, through Abraham's to see what's a, what's a family based on God look like? What's it look like to parent based on faith? And, and what does this show us? And if you don't have kids at home, um, then we're going to touch on that in a bit as well. And if you don't have kids at all, you, you're not parenting, then take these and apply them to how you interact with your, your coworkers, your friends, your neighbors, uh, because a lot of these principles carry over. But the, I got two big ideas for us this morning. The first is this. If we want to have a family that's, that's based on God and based on faith, we need to make God a family priority. That's thing one. We need to make God a family priority. This is Abraham's example to us because Abraham isn't here in Scripture and they're not saying, hey, Abraham had, had these goals for his family and he had these like job and family goals and God kind of fit in this way. It's the opposite. He said Abraham is following God and, and this is how his family responded and interacted with that. And for us, if we want our family to grow up, if we want our family to progress along in life and get to the point where they, they know and love Jesus and follow him with our, their life, it starts with us. 
because he is, is a student pastor, this is something that's, that's very near to my heart because I read all the, the articles and statistics that say that teenagers who grow up in church and say they love Jesus, once they get to college and to the workforce, they stop going to church and loving Jesus. And, and so with that, we're like, okay, why? Why is that the case? Because we see it all the time, but why? And what are the things we can do as a church, as a ministry to prevent that from happening and help those transitions? And so we've read, we've read dozens of these studies, and, and the number one thing it keeps coming back to is consistent among all of them. They say if you want your kids to grow up and have a faith that is active and real in their life, it comes down to one thing, and that's are you as a parent modeling what a real and active faith looks like? Over and over and over again, these studies show these kids are, that have a real and active faith as young adults say, my parents modeled that for me. Not that their parents were perfect, not that they had it figured out, not that they were saints or anything like that, but that they were, they were striving as best they could in the situation to follow Jesus. And this applies to your friends, your neighbors, your coworkers. If you want them to know and love Jesus, they've got to see a model for it. They've got to know what that looks like. And so that comes back to, is God the number one priority in your life and in the life of your family? Because the hard truth is this. If we as families make sports or education or fun or traveling or experiences the number one priority of our family, we should never be surprised if our kids grow up and don't decide to make God the number one priority of their family. Because what we model today will be reflected in their future. So, so where is God in your list of priorities? Let me challenge you to, to look at that and to examine where is God in, in our family priorities, in my personal priorities? I'm not saying that you, this means you have to come to church all seven days of the week. We don't even have stuff seven days a week here because this has much less to do about what happens here at church and a whole lot more to do about what happens at home. And what do you, what do you, what do your family, what do your kids see you modeling? How do they see you responding to life and to those moments? And even though today's Mother's Day, um, this has actually a lot more to do with, with us as guys, dads. God has structured families to be led by you. You are to be the, the spiritual leader and kind of head of your household. That's how God has structured this. This passage isn't talking about the faith of Sarah, although she had it. It's talking about the faith of Abraham and how he led his family in, in following God and making him a priority. So, so guys, but parents in general, how are you modeling a relationship with Jesus to your family? How are they seeing you respond to life's moments and difficulties? When people on the road are being less than wise, when coworkers do stupid things, when stress comes into life, how do your kids, how do your family, how do your friends see you respond? When your family members fail, they mess up, they make mistakes, what is your response as a parent? Is it to respond with grace and forgiveness and mercy or with judgment and condemnation over their failure? All these things reflect what they take away about what following God is. So, so what are you modeling, but also how are you making God moments happen? Because along the way, we've got to find ways as parents to sprinkle in moments where they experience God. And this is everything from, from them being a part of, of classes that are age appropriate to them, everything from that to having conversations. Hey, what'd you learn today? What'd you hear? What do you, what do you think God is? Let's, let's read some from this book and let's, let's look at this. Everything from that to, to making camps a priority, making those happen. And this, you might be kind of getting ready to sigh, and you're like, okay, here comes the youth pastor camp spiel. And, and there's a reason for it. I don't make any money off camps. It doesn't do me any good, except for the fact that I get to see amazing moments happen every summer with students. I get to see students go to camp who they go because there's going to be girls or volleyball or paintball happening. And they're like, sure, I'll go and shoot people with paintball guns, and I'll go have fun. And they talk to me at the end of the week, and they're like, you know what? I thought this whole God thing was a joke. I thought you're all freaks and weird, but I just wanted to come and hang out with girls and play volleyball. But I'm interested. I'm interested in who Jesus is. Can I have a Bible so I can learn more about him? Or I have conversations with students who are like, man, I've been wrestling with, with who God is and, and whether or not I want to follow him, and I'm committed. Right now, I want to follow Jesus. What do I need to do? 
Or, or I hear them come back and say, man, I've been following God and I was up at camp and I just started thinking about how I should do ministry with my sports team or at school or with this club or at work. Can you help me figure out how to do that? And these are because God moments happen in those concentrated times. So, so how, can you, how can you facilitate that? How can you make some God moments happen for your kids? And if you're, if you're here and you've got adult children around or, or you've got grandchildren, let me, let me say a few things to you. First, don't beat yourself up over your past decisions. All the time, we have people come to us and have conversations, and they're like, man, God's a priority in my family now. He wasn't when I had kids at home, and I just am broken up about these, you know, how I didn't raise them in church, how I didn't make God a priority, and I don't know what to do. And so don't hold your past self to your current self's expectations, if that's you. But instead, have a conversation with your family and say, hey, God wasn't a priority to me then. He is now. Let me tell you why. Let me tell you what he's doing in my life and why he matters to me. Give me a second chance, and more importantly, give God a second chance in this. But secondly, if you're, if you're a grandparent, I want you to understand that you have such a bigger chance of impact than just being a fun facilitator and a toy provider. And, and I get grandparents, you guys love providing those two things. My son loves hanging around with his, his grandparents because he, he has fun, joy, really. It's beyond fun. It's joy. Um, and, and they get him cool things. Like, we don't get him cool stuff, apparently, because he only plays with the stuff they give him. But, but he loves being around that. But understand, you guys, if you are around grandchildren, have such an opportunity to impact them for the future by having conversations about, why God matters to you, about why you're at the point in life, about what God has done in your life and, and how God's shown up. Imagine Abraham and Sarah, how many generations they shared the story of Isaac's birth with, about how God miraculously provided the son. You got to imagine that story went on for generations and was used to say, hey, you doubt if God's real? Look at what he did. Look at what he did in my life. I know he's real and here's how. So grandparents, how can you facilitate those God moments through conversations, through opportunities to do that? And all of this matters because if we want families that are, that are following Jesus and committed to him, we have to model that for them. We have to model what a life following Jesus looks like. So first, make God a family priority. Secondly, trust God with your children. Faith-based parenting involves trusting God with your children. And as parents, it seems like we've been given the, the seemingly impossible task of balancing how much to like parent and control and guide our kids versus how much freedom and independence we give them. And it starts out really easy because, you know, you start with this little infant who literally can't do anything on their own. And so it's all you. If, if you don't do what you need to do, they're not moving forward in life. Like it's all you. And they get to elementary age, and it's nice because they can do some things on their own. They can, you know, usually make their own breakfast at some point. They can pack their own lunch as long as you're okay with, like, M&Ms and Kit Kats for lunch. Um, and the best thing of all, the thing I'm looking forward to the most about being out of the toddler phase is they can wipe their butt on their own. Like, you're not needed for that anymore, which is going to be amazing for us. But then they become teenagers. And... <laughs> And the thing they want most in life is freedom and independence and responsibility. And yet, if we're honest, the thing they mess up with the most is freedom, independence, and responsibility. So how much do you give them of the thing they want more than anything in life? How much do you give them when they start working, when they start driving? How much do you control what type of people they hang out with or don't hang out with? What happens when they mess up? How many of those privileges do you take away and, and how quick do you give them back? It's complicated. And it doesn't get a whole lot easier when they become adults because then when you're, when you're parenting adult children, you're still looking at their life and you see, hey, you're, you're doing good in this moment. And then the next week you're like, wow, you're about to run into a brick wall at full speed. What should I do? And as a parent, you have to decide, do I, do I interject? Do I stop? Do I prevent that from happening? Or do I let them learn that hard lesson on their own? See, the, the balance there is difficult. But the truth is, God has called us to trust Him with our children. 
not trust our, our parenting approach, not trust our, our efforts of protection and safety, not trust our discipline and time out, you know, approach or anything like that, but to trust him. And Abraham knew this better than any of us, likely. Because Abraham, after getting the son he had desired for all his life, is, is one day having a conversation with God, and God says, hey, Abraham, I've, I've got something I'd like you to do. I'd like for you to go to the specific mountain and offer a burnt sacrifice, build an altar and offer a sacrifice for me there. It was pretty routine. This is something he had done before, but this time it was different because God says, instead of offering a lamb or anything like that, an animal, I want you to offer up your son, your only son, Isaac. And if you're, if you're new to following God, stick with me because this might seem like where the crazy train exit is and you're like, okay, this is where I stop. Stick with me. Abraham says, okay, God, I trust you. So they get the supplies, they gather everything up. It says they travel to the mountain. It says that he and Isaac unload and they start walking up the mountain. And you know there's, there's some conversations and tense moments here. The scripture gives us one of them. It says that, that Isaac turns to him and says, hey, dad, I see the, the supplies we have here. I see the wood, I see the rope, I see everything else. Where's our sacrifice? Abraham knew what God had asked him to do, so he just tells Isaac, God will provide. So they get to the top of the mountain, they get the lumber, they start building, they complete the altar. You got to imagine there's some other conversations with Isaac happening in this too. You got to think that Abraham was like, okay, God, any time now, when are you going to show up? He finishes the altar he takes Isaac and it says he binds him with rope. He ties him up, places him on the altar. And it says he goes and retrieves his knife and he stands over the altar, over Isaac, and he lifts up his knife to take the next step. And in that moment, God says, Abraham, wait. Stop. Do not take the life of your son. He says, instead, look to the side. There's a, a ram caught in the thicket. Go and offer that instead. In the moment, Isaac had to have a ton of questions here. But Abraham as well learned something important because God needed to know in that moment, where am I in your list of priorities? You love your son. Your son's a priority in your life. But is he number one or is God number one? In that moment, God talks with Abraham after, and he says, because I see you did not hesitate to follow my instructions and offer your son Isaac, whom you love, I will continue to pour blessings into your life. I will reestablish my covenant with you. And God shows us in that moment, not that we should be reckless with our kids, or if, or if they get bad enough, we tie them up and threaten to light them on fire. <laughs> Although their face may make a viral video. Don't do that. Instead, we're shown here that God cares much more about how committed we are to him than how safe or protected or perfect our kids' lives appear to be. So today, do you trust God with your children? Do you trust God with every aspect of your life, even the things that are most dear to you? Because the challenge is on us. The challenge is on us to model what a godly life looks like, not only for our for our kids, but our spouses, our coworkers, our neighbors, our friends. Scripture says that we should let our light, our, our good works, shine before others so that they may see our good works and give glory to our Father in heaven. We're to model out that lifestyle so people have a picture of what it looks like, and that starts with our family. But secondly, do you trust God with your kids? Do you trust God with the things that are most dear to you? Are you willing to say, God, I put you first and them second? And all this comes back to one simple question, and that is, are you fully convinced of God's promises? Abraham was fully convinced. It says no doubt or unbelief made him waver. He was fully convinced that God would do as he had promised. See, God has said that he can work mightily in our lives. It says that God can restore, redeem. He can work and create things that, that did not exist, as it says here in Romans do you believe that God can work in your life in this way? 
Because when we have faith and trust in him, God can radically transform and change our life, just like we see with Abraham and his wife Sarah here. But it comes down to us and where we're at. Do you have faith? Do you trust? Do you believe that Jesus will do as he says? Our prayer for you is that you would have that faith and that God would work in your life in amazing ways. Let's pray.